everyone, um, my name is James and I am an alcoholic. At least, uh, at least I was. I think, I was trying to think about this, and I think I first realised that I had a real drinking problem when I woke up in the morning in my clothes with a really bad red wine hangover, and I decided the best way to fix it would be to have a beer while I was driving to school. <laughs> yeah, that was year 13. <laughs> I, had a, I had kind of an interesting thing. I remember driving along with a beer in one hand and a smoke in the other hand, thinking, maybe I've got a problem. <laughs> but I thought about it and I realised that my drinking wasn't as bad as my uncle's or as my granddad's and I was still passing school, so nah, it was, it was all good, it was all good. I was generally pretty unhappy, but it was all good. So um, I spent most of my nights and most of my days drunk or stoned from uh, the start of year 12 until I become a Christian. And then after that, I only spent some of my nights drunk. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a really... Oh, look at that photo. Cool. <laughs> Looks like a hipster. Anyway. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing becoming a Christian when you've come out of a culture like that because... You know, not many Christians smoke, so I gave up smoking pretty quickly. And not many Christians do drugs. Actually, how about anyone does drugs? I've gone. Um, <laughs> it's kind of seen as the devil, so I gave that up pretty quickly. But lots of Christians drink, and so I kept, I kept drinking. Drinking was just part of, part of my life. It was part of my normal. I didn't get really drunk around my Christian friends. I say it's getting really drunk for when I was around my family or when I was around my non-Christian friends, or when I was with all of my non-judgmental Christian friends. Both of them. Uh, the problem was this, right? Drinking was so normal to me. It was just what I did. That was, that was me. And then I started getting involved in faith, and I started getting more involved in church, and hearing sermons, and reading my Bible, and you've seen all the scriptures. I started realizing that, that I had a problem, that I was like... The Bible described me as a sinner, just endlessly, and it was tough, you know, so I'd listen, I realized I needed to do something about it, and so I listened to sermon after sermon, and I'd go on to church, and I'd read my Bible, and I'd pray, and, and I'd do really well for a couple of days, and then, and then I'd find myself thinking, ah, oh, just one or two will be fine, you'll be all good, and one or two would turn into five or six which would turn into 9 or 10, and you know where that ends up. To forgery. <laughs> Come on. Um, I found myself really, really relating to Paul in Romans where he says, I don't understand why I act the way I do. I don't, I don't do what I know is right, and I do the things I hate. Which summed me up, but man, it didn't really offer me any hope. It's, like, it's just a bit of a stuck feeling. The fact is this, for me, I realized that you can sit through hundreds of sermons and you can read your Bible every day and you can still be struggling with a life crippling addiction. And that was me for years. Until, until I learned this. Uh -huh. Oh! I made that slide in Photoshop. <laughs> what? What's funny? <laughs> The mind will justify what the heart desires. This is a um, Blaise Pascal quote. And what this, what this meant to me, what I realized was that no one drinks just because they can. People always drink for a reason. Everyone when they drink, they drink for a reason. And, and that reason is that we're trying to meet our needs. We all have needs, we're trying to meet them. You're born with needs, when you're a baby, you pop out, needs, straight away. All sorts of needs, like a real basic need you have when you're born is the need for clothing. And when we are young, our needs are really basic, like, three-year-olds have the need for clothing, but they don't care what they wear. Like, I love it when you go to a supermarket and you see some little three-year-old running around dressed like Superman, you're like, yeah, what's up, man, you can fly! Um, but... As you grow up, your needs get more and more complex, more and more complicated. Like if you went to a supermarket and you saw a 50-year-old man walking around dressed like Superman, you probably wouldn't talk to him. Um, what I realized was this, was that we do stuff to meet our needs. And if alcohol has met a need for you in the past, and then you are confronted with that need again, then your brain will justify reasons why you should drink to meet that need. Let me give you an example.
example, you know, you'll start, you'll start finding yourself in a situation and then you'll start thinking, oh, it's okay this time, you know, because I'm at this wedding, or oh, it's okay this time because it's a work thing, or it's okay this time because I won't have so much that I can't drive, or it's okay this time because I know when to stop, or it's okay this time because it'll be weird if I don't. The mind will justify ways for you to meet that need, and if drinking has met that need for you in the past, then it will keep doing it. That was my dilemma. That was where I was, I was stuck. And so what I want to do is just have a look at four of the real common needs that people drink to try and meet. Um, definitely the reasons that I've drunk. So the first one is, is belonging. That's cool. So this is like a kind of guy version of belonging, like, hey mate, come and have a beer. Yay, they like me! This pump! Um, I decided to try and include girls in this one as well, so I did a girl version of belonging, which is, hey, do you want to ride a pony with me? <laughs> wow, yes! <laughs> Girls love ponies, man. Um, <laughs> the fact is this: drinking can meet your need for belonging. There is a there is a camaraderie. There is a there is a sense of connectedness when people get together and drink. It facilitates socialising. And if I ask you the question, is drinking a social thing or an antisocial thing? The answer is both, depending on how we're drinking. So drinking can be social as long as you don't bring your mates. <laughs> like Shouty Steve, or <laughs> Preachy Petra, or Eternal Burn Trish, or <laughs> Gossipy Georgia, or I don't know. Right? So drinking, uh, it can meet this need and it can not meet this need as well. Another massive one is self-worth. I like myself because I'm muscly. I did a girl version as well. I like myself because I'm muscly. <laughs> Everyone wants to like themselves, but sadly heaps of people don't. And when you find yourself in situations where you're feeling unliked or unattractive or unwanted, some people will think that drinking, drinking can make that feeling go away. And it does, for a little bit. And then that feeling comes back. In fact, if drinking was a sustainable way to feel good about yourself, then alcoholics would be the happiest people in the world. Question, if you felt totally rejected, how would you cope? So this is a massive need. Here's uh, another need, boredom. Man, there's nothing to do in the city. Oh, here, have some beer. <laughs> Did a girly one as well? I'm bored. Let's go to the toilets and get a toilet. <laughs> I don't understand, girls. <laughs> Gen Y, apparently. We have the shortest attention span of any generation that has ever existed. Ever. Like, look, you're born right now, you're sitting here texting! <laughs> What's that about? Freaking Gen Y. One sociologist, one sociologist said that the biggest problem with our generation was Sesame Street. Which sounds strange, but Sesame Street taught us that boring stuff should be exciting. Because learning's not that exciting. Like, if you're learning, maybe like once in a whole learning session you go, oh, the rest of it is like, ooh. But Sesame Street is like, oh, oh, oh. It teaches us that everything should be exciting, stimulating, and sometimes life just isn't that fun when people are, have nothing to do and are getting bored. You know, a lot of people end up thinking the only way to make things more fun is if we're drinking. Can you have a good time if you're not drinking? Hell yes. Oh, that person can. <laughs> You sounded a little bit too keen on that though. Anyway, last one I want to look at is this one here, wanting to feel better. Ouch, want a beer? Is that sacrilege? I'm not... It's okay! Yeah. I did a girly one as well. Oh, I just watched The Notebook 27 times and I realised I'm never going to find love! Um, like a beer? <laughs> Sometimes life sucks. Sometimes life. I don't. I don't know what your life experience has been, but for me, it seems like the older I get, the, the more stuff that sucks. I don't know about you, but life just gets more and more complicated. You know, you start thinking about things like your career, or or someone you're going to spend your life with, or or a marriage, but a wedding and in-laws and. And maybe you're thinking about having kids and that's not working for you. Or maybe you had kids and you weren't planning to. Or 
maybe you've got no money, or maybe you're studying, or maybe you've got no money because you're studying, or <laughs> maybe, maybe your house got mashed in the earthquake, or maybe someone that you really care about passed away, or maybe your friends moved away, or like, I, I don't know what it is, but sometimes life is really hard, and sometimes God seems silent, sometimes... Sometimes God seems distant, and our culture offers an answer, and it's, are oh, you feeling a bit down? Well, let's have a few beers. <laughs> now, I used to speak in high schools for a job, and I was talking about depression one time, and this guy stuck up his hand, and he goes, yeah, bro, but beer is cheaper than counseling. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. But, drinking will never fix your problems. Facing them actually can. You know, the... Drinking to try and escape your problems, drinking post-earthquake, drinking to deal with anxiety or fear or depression, it's the same as running from your problems. And the Bible actually tells us not to run from our problems. I'll quote Paul from Romans. He says, We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Richard Brewer, who's one of my favorite Catholic authors. Am I going to quote a Catholic person? You can quote Catholic! Awesome, yeah. He just put it like this. He says, happiness in life doesn't come from running from your pain. Happiness in life comes on the other side of pain. It comes when you go through it. So when things fall apart for you, when stuff hurts, what do you turn to? Because beer was my fix for years. I guess my big question is actually this. It's how do you meet your needs? Maybe if, if you're a visual person, let me just sum it up like this. I really like that. That took me, like, I'm going to be honest, about two minutes to make. <laughs> as long as you have more reasons to drink than not to drink, then you'll find yourself drinking even when part of you doesn't want to. Conversely, if you have more reasons not to drink than you do to drink, then you'll find yourself not drinking even when part of you wants to. In fact, some theologians would say that you really only have free will when you've got as many reasons to do that thing as you have to not do that thing. Now, I'm, I'm not a theologian. I don't have a degree in theology. I don't have a degree. I've got a certificate in Christian ministry. Which looks awesome on my CV, by the way. <laughs> I, guess, I guess what I'll say is this. For me, I worked out that there was better ways to meet my needs than by getting drunk. And when I learned that, I never looked back. I believe in a God who can and wants to meet every single one of these needs for all of us. And he, and he can. And for me, I realized that, uh, that drinking wasn't making me the type of person that God dreamed I could be. And... Uh, you know, we got shown that stat earlier that 25% of New Zealanders were heavy drinkers, and that was definitely me. And so for me, uh, four years ago, I decided that drinking wasn't, wasn't even part of who I wanted to be, so I gave up drinking altogether. Some people kind of ask me about that. They're like, surely one or two is okay. Um, I just quote St. Augustine back to them. He said that total abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. And for me, someone who really struggled with alcohol, that's definitely true. So guys, I hope um, I hope some of those thoughts are helpful. Thanks for listening. Cheers.